Our next exciting and engaging speaker is Howard Ross, who will talk to us about everyday bias in healthcare professions. I've gotten the opportunity to hear Howard speak multiple times, and I'm, I learn something new every time because there's a lot to be learned. Uh, Howard is the founder and chief learning officer of Cook Ross Incorporated and an organizational development consultant and educator. <clears throat> he is considered one of the world's seminal thought leaders on identifying and addressing unconscious bias. He's the author of two books. One is Reinventing Diversity, Transforming Organizational Community to Strengthen People, Purpose, and Performance. And another book, Everyday Bias, Identifying and Navigating Unconscious Judgments in Our Daily Lives. Cook Walls programs have focused on the areas of corporate culture change, leadership development, and managing diversity. Through his work at Cook Ross, he has successfully implemented large-scale organizational culture change efforts in academic institutions, professional services, corporate, other corporations, Fortune 500 companies, and retail, healthcare, media, and governmental institutions. Welcome, Howard Ross. Thanks so much, David. And hi, everybody. So in the interest of in the interest of diversity, we have yet another bald, fast-talking white guy. So, <laughs> what can I say? You know, I'm uh, I'm actually I'm actually all kidding aside. I'm really pleased to be here. My two oldest boys uh, graduated from Michigan, and uh, so we ble bleed maize and blue in our family. And uh, you know, we go back to the days of Ramil Robinson and Glenn Rice and, and all that time. So it's 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 always really good to be here. But I want to start with a little video clip. Hospedeira, arranjo outro lugar. Minha senhora, a classe económica está lotada. Desculpe, eu não vou viajar ao lado do negro. Faça qualquer coisa. Eu vou falar com o comandante. O comandante manda dizer que conseguimos arranjar lugar na primeira classe. Ah, e pedi-me essas desculpas. Realmente é inconcebível um passageiro viajar ao lado de uma pessoa tão desprezível. Senhor, acompanhe, por favor. Yes, if only, right? This was the, the video was put together by some friends of mine at the Portuguese Institute for Human Rights. And uh, you know, I show the video not only because it's a future we would all love to be living in, but, but more importantly, this is the way mostly we, what, mostly what we think about when we think about bias. You know, overt actions of behavior that are egregious and hurt people, um, prevent people from being able to participate or the like. And of course, we know these things happen. We see them happening in our country today. We read the newspapers every day and know these kinds of events actually occur. But the fact is that the research shows that in environments like yours, that's a very small percentage of the impact that, that differentiates people's ability to be successful. Very few people wake up in the morning and come into your environment and say, how can I suppress the women here today? How can I hold down the people of color? You know, it doesn't actually work that way. Mostly it occurs in subtle ways. And I was really pleased to be with Scott again because um, you know, Scott's research, of course, uh, was, was pivotal in uh, the ability to be able to explain to people why it was important to have diversity in organizations. But as Scott was describing with the bell curves he put up, there's also something really interesting about this notion of getting people together because on one hand, we know that Scott's findings are true, that we get this amazing ability to increase our productivity, increase our problem solving, increase creativity and innovation, and all of these kinds of things. But Bob Putnam at, at Harvard University sent his team out, and some of you know Putnam's work. He studies social capital, wrote a book, a groundbreaking book in around 2000 called Bowling Alone. And what they did is they sent researchers out to interview 30,000 people in the most diverse environments in the United States and found, in fact, the opposite was occurring. That in those environments, there was an almost complete breakdown in, in social systems that we largely think about bringing communities together. So things like um, the Cub Scouts, the Boy Scouts, the Girl Scouts, uh, the Brownies, um, uh, PTAs, uh, civic associations, that in diverse, in diverse communities, what's tending to happen in our country is people are pulling back into their own clans. And Putnam, by the way, is somebody who supports diversity. They said, do you think this is, that, that this means diversity is not a good thing? And he said, no, not at all, but it's not sufficient to throw people together and expect them to work it out. 
And this is unfortunately what we've done in a lot of cases when we focused only on representation. That the challenge to diversity actually starts that way. And since, we, since diversity is now inevitable in our culture, uh, it's, you know, I had a conversation recently with a, in a corporate environment I was working in. Somebody says, well, I just don't believe in diversity. He said, well, do you also not believe in the constellations? I mean, it's real whether you like it or not. So the question then becomes, where are we going to be on the page to Putnam pipeline? Are we going to get the benefits that Scott's talking about, or are we going to suffer the consequences that Putnam's talking about? And that's, I think, at the real heart of the, of the conversation I want to have with you today, which is, is this determined only by what we learn or what we know? And in fact, the core of the message that I want to leave you with today is that the myth, that the myth of rationality that we live in, and particularly in academic environments, the myth of rationality we live in gets in the way of our being able to really work deeply with this issue. We think, particularly in the academic environment, we think that we know what's going on around us. But let's explore that for a minute. Clearly, somebody in this room murdered Lord Smythe who, at precisely 3.34 this afternoon, was brutally bludgeoned to death with a blunt instrument. I want each of you to tell me your whereabouts at precisely the time that this dastardly deed took place. I was polishing the brass in the master bedroom. I was buttering his lordship's scones below stairs, sir. Why, I was planting my petunias in the potting shed. Constable, arrest. Lady Smythe! But, but, but how did you know? Madam, as any horticulturist will tell you, one does not plant petunias until May is out. Take her away. Sorry, it's just a matter of observation. The real question is how observant were you? Uh, uh, Clearly, somebody in this room murdered Lord Smythe, who at precisely 3.34 this afternoon, was brutally bludgeoned to death with a blunt instrument. I want each of you to tell me your whereabouts at precisely the time that this dastardly deed took place. I was polishing the brass in the master bedroom. I was buttering his lordship's scones below stairs, sir. But I was planting my petunias in the potting shed. Constable, arrest. Lady Smythe. So how many of you, highly educated, <laughs> supremely qualified, scientifically minded people saw more than two or three changes in that video, assuming you'd never seen it before? How many saw none? Yeah. And how many of us, how many of you have been in a circumstance, let's say a meeting, um, a presentation, something. Something happened, and you were sort of stunned by what happened because it was like completely off. Somebody did something that was completely off or insensitive or sort of a blind spot showed. And you walk out of the meeting and you say to somebody else, wait, did you see that? And they're like, what are you talking about? How many of you have had that happen to you? Yeah. How many of you have been the one to say, what are you talking about? Right. <laughs> see, the nature of the mind is we think that we see everything around us, but we actually see a tiny percentage. I mean, the actual numbers, of course, are different depending upon which researcher you talk about, you talk to. But, but some people estimate that we're exposed to as many as 11 million data points at any one time. Right now, 11 million data points. And we can absorb about 50. So we're constantly filtering out these data points based on different things that we're interested in, different things that are important to us, different things that threaten our survival, different things that our life experience brings focus to. And we've all, any of us who have small children know this, when you ask them to go to the cupboard and see if they can find the light bulbs, and they say, no, they're not there anywhere, and you go and they're right in front of you. <laughs> you know, our mind gets shifted, and also by our expectations. I had this happen in my office just about uh, two weeks ago. I was looking for um, uh, some aspirin. You know, I had a little headache, and I wanted to take a couple of aspirin. And I asked somebody, do we have any aspirin? They say, yeah, it's up in such and such a cabinet where we keep our first aid stuff. And I go, and I'm looking, and I'm looking, and I'm looking, and I can't find them. I'm looking for the bottle of aspirin. And then, of course, I say to her, where is it? She says, it's right there. It was in a box. I was looking for a bottle. So, so the mind works this way. It's not, <clears throat> excuse me, it's not only what we see, it's also what we hear. So I want to do another little experiment with you. I'm going to draw a line down the middle. I'd like everybody on this side of the room, when you watch the screen, 
By the way, Denise told me that some of you, have, you know, Denise was at a training we did about this. So some of you have been in the trainings that you're doing here. You may have seen a couple of these experiments. So let other people have their opportunity if you have, okay? So everybody over here, what I'd like you to do is close your eyes in just a moment. I promise I won't let them take your stuff. Everybody over here, keep your eyes open and watch the screen. I'm gonna show a short five second video. I'm gonna ask you what you hear, okay? Please close your eyes. Here we go. Ba, 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 ba. Good, so open your eyes. So if you heard ba, ba, raise your hands. Look around the room. Okay, you put them down. If you heard something like da, da, ga, ga, raise your hands. Hmm. Okay. I'll play it again. This time you can open and close your eyes at intervals. You'll actually hear it change right before your eyes. Ba, 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 ba. Hmm. Now, aside from being way cool, what does this teach us? <laughs> We actually hear with our eyes more than we realize. <laughs> In this case, it happens because the voiceover is of him saying ba ba, but the video is of, of this person saying ga ga. Over here, all you heard was the voice. You actually heard what was said. Over here, the brain plays tricks with us. We get the video signal and the audio signal and have to morph it together. It comes out for most people into a D, a little L, or a little bit of a G. But the point is we're affected without even realizing we're affected. Now, this can happen in lots of ways. Sometimes it can happen because of what we expect to hear. So for example, I spent a year as a professor of diversity and residence at Bennett College for Women, which is a historically black college in Greensboro, North Carolina. And one day I was having lunch with the president of the college in her office. And before lunch, four, three other people, and before lunch, we prayed because it's a Methodist school in the South and they pray over everything down there. So somebody said, close our eyes and we prayed and it was a Christian prayer and evoke Jesus and I'm Jewish. Now, I'm not at all offended by that. In fact, my wife grew up in a Christian home. But, um, but it does bring it up to awareness. You know, it brings it up to consciousness. So we open our eyes and the person next to me turns to the person next to him and says, by the way, we also have Jews here. And I thought to myself, well, that was a nice attempt on his part to be inclusive until she responded by saying, no, water's fine, thank you. Juice. He said juice. Right. But because my mind was now primed to hear that, what did I hear? Who can relate to what I'm saying? You've had something like that happen. Yeah. This is the way the mind works. Now, it's not only about, it's, the, it's not only in funny ways, but it's also in very real ways. So I want to show you a little clip. This is a little ABC News thing about a study that was done at Yale that's relevant to what we're talking about. boss, she's bossy. The negative way women are perceived at the office in a new ad for Pantene that's gone viral. It's hit a nerve, so we set out to find the truth. Are women who act exactly the same as men seen differently? Listen to this woman. How do you feel about her as a job candidate? I know the Windows operating systems like the back of my hand, no problem. Now, listen to him. I know the Windows operating systems like the back of my hand, no problem. The candidates in these videos are actors in a Yale University hiring experiment. The resumes, identical. The interviews, identical. I'm extremely, extremely good, good at sizing, sizing up people, people quickly and delegating, and delegating responsibility, responsibility accordingly. The only difference is gender. But when it comes to who got the job? I thought the male applicant had better soft skills. I'd say the woman was um, arrogant and overselling. In hundreds of evaluations, the female job seekers come off as more aggressive, are rated less likable, and they're less likely to be hired. Isn't it a catch-22? You're supposed to be strong to get that job, mm -hmm. and you're saying if you're too strong, you won't get it. You need to behave in this dominant way to advance as a woman in the workplace, but you're seen negatively because that's not how we expect women to behave. And if you think this is just male bias, it's not. Both men and women doing the hiring made the same call. I think there's a level of arrogance that becomes, that might be okay to be a manager, but then there's a step above, and I thought she was slightly above that. So let's talk. And when we revealed our study results. I was surprised by my uh, reaction. What does that say about us? We have a long way to go. Yes, indeed. So what I want to do with you this morning is um, spend our time this morning unpacking a little bit what we're learning about why and how this happens. So mostly this morning, what I'm going, to, I'm going to be focusing on that. What is this phenomenon of bias? How are we seeing it impacts us? And you know, 
what's the nature of it. And then when we come back after lunch, and by the way, you've got on your tables here this thing called the big decision. Just leave that for now. That's a quick exercise you're going to do it before you leave the room to go to lunch um, to get your food. And then when we come back after lunch, what we're going to do, we're going to process that exercise. And then we're going to look at the second part, which is what can we do about it? What can we do about it individually? How can we um, uh, bring more consciousness and mindfulness to the decisions we make individually? And critically important, especially for this group, what can you do structurally, what can you do in an institution to create environments that call people to look more thoughtfully at the decisions they make so that we can manage that bias as effectively as possible. You notice I don't say eliminate that bias, because at the core of what I'm going to be telling you all day today is we can't. Bias is as natural to human beings as breathing. And one of the things that we in the diversity industry um, have kind of done that's, that's created um, kind of a misnomer in this regard is the notion that we can drive bias out of our system. And all that we've actually done by the way we've approached it in a lot of cases, and mind you, I've been doing this work for 30 years, so it's not a condemnation of anybody. We've tried to do the best way. I go back to the time where we used to do diversity training with a two by four. Kind of whack at people, especially if they look like this, until somebody sees the error of their ways and has a great cathartic experience and cries. And everybody feels good about it. And then if you saw those people a month later, more times than not, they'd say, that was fine. Don't ever make me do it again. You know, it was, it was a recipe for getting people to uh, not do bad stuff and be afraid of doing bad stuff, but it's not a recipe for inclusion because in a lot of cases it makes us more afraid to talk about issues rather than more willing to talk about those issues. So, so we're going to be talking about that and, and looking at some, what are some of the things that we can do. So I want to start with just a few of the literally 1,500 studies now that have been done in the last 10 years alone on how unconscious bias affects us. I mean, this is, as, as many of you know, an exploding field of study. <coughs> Excuse me. So this one comes from the University of Wisconsin. Uh, this researcher studied men's and women's um, uh, tenure packages, found that when women's, th when women's names were associated with the tenure packages, there were four times as many comments in the margins. We'd have to see her job talk. It's impossible, impossible to make such a judgment without more information. I need to see evidence that she's gotten those grants and publications on her own. Same, same content depending upon the name. Similarly, the study that Scott referenced before um, that Corrine, who we just saw up there, and, um, and a number of other researchers did where they gave uh, a resume for a potential lab assistant to, to a science faculty, exactly the same. The, the only difference was the names were John or Jennifer. When John was the name, John was rated 4 out of 7. Jennifer was rated 3.3 .3 out of 7. John was offered $4,000 more annually in salary. He was seen as more likely to hire <coughs> and willing to mentor. Interestingly enough, and probably not surprising to many of you, the female faculty's responses were no different than the male faculty's responses. Virtually identical. Now, this is important for us to recognize because we internalize these biases about people like ourselves virtually as much as we have those biases about other people. And no surprise for that, we all swim in, this, swim in the same soup out here. We're all being exposed to the same things. We're all being shown the same models. And so even when we're consciously trying to do something about this, we may, we may have these embedded models without even realizing it that dictate the implicit ways that we respond to some of these circumstances. Here's another one at the University of, um, at, at Harvard Brigham. Um, implicit bias among physicians and predictions of thrombolysis decisions. So they went to physicians, they gave them the implicit association test. How many of you are familiar with the implicit association test? Just raise your hand. For those of you who are not, you may want to jot this down. The IAT, you can just Google it. It's a computer-based test that was created at Harvard, University of Virginia, and University of Washington. And it's designed to give you feedback as to some of the unconscious associations you make between different groups. So you can go on and take the test, and you'll see that you know, there's one, that there, there are 20 or so on the website alone, and there are hundreds that they've done. And it kind of gives you a quick snapshot. Oh, you tend to have more positive associations with this group versus that group. Now, mind you, it's not a report card on your soul. It has nothing to do with whether or not you're a good person. In fact, it can be quite upsetting when you look at it because you may learn things. How many people, when you took the implicit association test, were a little put off by the results in that way? You were surprised. Yeah, because it measures your unconscious beliefs, not your conscious beliefs. And that's one of the things we want to stress is that our unconscious associations might be completely contrary to our conscious beliefs. So what they did was they gave the IAT to a group of doctors, um, and, then they, and then they tracked um, how they made uh, 
made uh, uh, direction to thrombolysis procedures for patients who are white or black, depending upon the particular predictive mechanism. And what they found was that there was almost a direct correlation between the IET results of the physicians and their, and their predictive behavior. So in other words, if you tended to show great, closer association with white people, you sent more white people to the procedures, and vice versa. Um, what it comes down to is our brains seem to have evolved to be good enough most of the time. Now, that's not a problem, except that we think we're right all of the time. And this is especially true. Now, here, here's the thing that's really interesting, because you know, those of us who are very well educated and we're smart and we've been sort of the people in the room who generally do better than other people throughout the course of our lives, in other words, most of you, um, we think that we can outthink this. This thing I'm talking about is for dumb people. But in fact, what the evidence shows is the exact opposite. That the smarter we are, the more self-confident we are about our knowledge, the more blind spots we have. We stop checking ourselves. So when we're a little insecure, we might question some of our beliefs, question some of our thoughts. But when we're used to being one of the brightest people in the room, and we believe something, we just assume it to be true. And so this is particularly true when we deal with folks who are high achievers, the people who've been really successful in that regard. So I want you to be thinking about how you see diversity, inclusion, and bias impacting your world as we're talking about this. Because as I said later on this, after, this afternoon, we're going to actually be looking at how do we focus some of this on some of the, th the work that you're doing, especially developing your strategy and rolling the strategy out. What are some of the things we need to especially pay attention to? <clears throat> So one thing that you can do, just as a little tool for yourself, if you want to take a piece of paper and just put a quick, you know, do your little T-square like that. I know that being with me can sometimes feel like drinking from a fire hose. I have a lot I want to share with you. And taking notes is sometimes, I know, the triumph of hope over reason. But, um, but if you at least capture for yourself, aha, wow. That's interesting. I need to talk to such and such about this. Or that may explain my relationship with such and such. You know, make a note of that, because otherwise, by the time we're finished this afternoon, you will have forgotten half of that. And I really want you to make this real for yourself. OK? So first of all, what do we associate with the word bias? How many of you notice when you hear that word, you have a negative association? Yeah, most of us do, because we've, we live inside of this bias equals badness paradigm. But of course, we don't pay attention to the fact that bias can also be life-altering and saving at certain times. For example, if you see somebody coming to you with fist clenched and a scowl on their face and walking to you, you don't say, oh, let me see what he's feeling when he gets here. <laughs> You know, very quick way to sort things out. Now, it's probably, you know, so we, so we know that bias is a tendency or inclination that results in judgment without question. That's all it is, a very simple tendency to do that. It could be positive and helpful at certain times. It could be dangerous, damaging, or even fatal at other times. So the question is not whether or not we have bias. The question is, do the biases we have operate consistent with our values, principles, and what we're trying to accomplish? And when we do what I said earlier, which is try to pretend like it's bad to have bias, or believe that it's bad to have bias, and try to make them go away. Ironically, what we do is we actually drive them deeper into the underground. How many of you have talked to somebody else, and you saw something that they were doing that, that was clearly off in terms of favoring one group versus another, whatever that group is, you know, whatever identity group you choose? And, and yet they saw themselves as sort of being progressive, for lack of a better word, on these issues. And when you tried to, to get them to see this, all that you got back was defensiveness. Just raise your hand if you've had that experience. Yeah. And of course, they've had the same experience with us without us realizing it. Because this is the nature of how we see ourselves. And one of the challenge with people who are really committed to diversity and really committed to, um, to being you know, more forward thinking, I, I believe, on these issues is that we begin to identify ourselves as the good people. We're the ones who already buy this. And the more we identify with that, the more our ego gets attached to seeing ourselves that way, the, the more difficult it can be sometimes for us to look at ourselves. So, you know, so I like to say, share with people you know, any number of examples. But one story I like to share is I was down at Jackson State, Mississippi, working with the faculty and deans at Jackson State College. I mean, in Jackson, Mississippi, I should say, with Jackson State College for a couple of days, about a year and a half ago. And I had to fly from there to go to New York City that night to, to be with another client. So I flew into the Memphis airport to change planes, get to, my air, get to my gate, and just as I get there, the gate attendant comes on and says, ladies and gentlemen, there'll be a 45-minute delay. 
And the words were barely out of her mouth when I hear a voice boom out from behind me. You talking to us, lady? And I turn around and there's a guy sitting behind me who I would best describe as Santa Claus with an attitude. <laughs> Older white guy, white beard, white hair, overalls, a flannel shirt, and a car magazine in his hand. Yeah, I chuckled too. I went about my business for a while. I was working on a you know, presentation I was giving the next day. And, and uh, time came to get on the airplane. I get to my seat. And lo and behold, who's sitting next to me but angry Santa? You know. <laughs> So we did the nod. Travelers know what I mean. You know, and then you kind of go about your business, go into parallel play. He's reading his magazine. I'm on my PowerPoint. If we fly for a couple hours until it's time to begin initial descent to New York, and the pilot comes on and says, close the computers. And people who fly regularly know that this is when airplane chat starts, because it's now safe to talk to the person next to you. You're not going to get roped into a two-hour conversation with a nutcase you can't get away from. Right? <laughs> so I say to the guy, um, what? Uh, what takes you to New York? And he says, I have a professional meeting. I said, really, what do you do? He says, I'm a radiologist. <laughs> Boom, there goes that picture, right? <laughs> and then being nonplussed and frankly a little embarrassed that after 30 years of professionally doing diversity and inclusion work, I'm still stereotyping people. Um, I kind of, a little nonplussed, I say, I say well, what kind of radiology? And he gets really animated. He says, well, I've, you'll probably be interested in this because I couldn't help but look at your PowerPoint. We're actually measuring different parts of the brain and looking for signals to indicate which part of the brains respond in what way when people interact with different kinds of people. <laughs> so had I not pegged him as angry Santa the car mechanic and talked about him earlier, I probably came, sort of could have saved myself two months of research on my book. You know? <laughs> So I'm not talking about you. I'm talking about us here. So this bias actually has two functions. One is it's an automatic response, so it saves us time. And, and, and as a result, it's a shortcut. So if I was you know, 20,000 years ago looking at those people around the waterhole, I had to make an instant decision whether it was them or us. It saved my life. I do the same thing ongoingly. It, it's an efficient way of operating. And what function does it serve? Well, it's mostly our unconscious danger detector. You know, it gives us a quick signal, and we'll talk a little bit more about the neurobiology behind this, just, just a little bit, because you know, whenever I talk about those kinds of subjects in a group like this, my internal threat response goes off, because I'm undoubtedly the least formally educated person in this room. So I know that there are people here who've forgotten more about that than I'll ever know, but nonetheless, we'll, we'll try that. Um, and as I said before, it can often conflict with our conscious behaviors. So let's talk just a little bit about how we see the world, because we've learned, a lot of you know, in the last 20 years, more about the mind and the brain than we've ever known. And it gives us huge insights to how we make some of these decisions. So we all have an internalized book of rules. We learn them throughout our whole life. We know how to be in certain circumstances. You know, if I were to go up to one of you and go like this, you would know to put out your hand and receive it because in this part of the world, that's a greeting. We know what that greeting is. And then we would also make determinations depending upon how firmly I shook your hand. So how many of you, um, how many of you have sort of an uncomfortable sensation when somebody shakes your hand, particularly a man shakes your hand with a really soft handshake? How many of you have had that? Yeah. And how many of you have even heard somebody say, or maybe even said yourself, uh, if somebody shakes their hand, my hand like that at the beginning of an interview, forget it, the interview's over. How many of you heard somebody say that? Now think about how ridiculous that is. I could come from about a third of the world where softer handshakes are actually more considered more appropriate. I could have an injury to my hand. I could have a disability in my hand. I could be recovering from an injury to my hand. I could, for some reason, feel like you have an injury in your hand. You know? I mean, we could go on. There are any number of permutations of why it is that I'm doing that, and yet, the mind looks for the quick answer. So we say, oh, soft handshake, forget it, move to the next person. Now, how many criteria do we use like that? Appearance, somebody walks in for an interview, the way they're dressed, eye contact, you know, hundreds of different, because we have this internalized book of rules. If we had a little more time, you could take some time talking at your table. And one of the things, by the way, I invite you and encourage you to do when you're doing your work together is to have some conversations about what books of rules are we operating from. Because this is one of the things I've noticed in diversity committees as we throw people together to work on diversity, we assume we're all working on the same page. But in truth, some of you have probably experienced that. We have different agendas we bring in. So it's, it's critically important as we do this. But this book of rules creates schema. And schema, as you know, are framing mechanisms of the mind that have us see certain things and not others. It's simple in certain forms. Like if you're, watch, if you're next time you're in an airport or a train station that has a shoeshine um, bench, watch the shoeshine guys as they're observing people walk down the hallway. You'll be seeing you know, the woman and the man and the children. What are they seeing? 
Shoes, exactly right. They're watching the shoes. And the only time in a lot of cases they pick their head up is when they see a dirty pair of shoes. Do you want to shine? If you ask them what they see, they'll say three floor shines, two loafers, and a pair of sneakers. Because that's what their schema gives them. Now, each of you in your field of study or your field of interest or expertise have have refined schema that allow you to see things that other people don't. My oldest son is an electrophysiologist. He's, you know, he left here, got his medical degree at Georgetown, and, and is now an electrophysiologist. He was t I was just talking about this just to him recently, and he said, you know, we have this young doctor who's now in our, you know, like new doctor in our practice, and he says he was with me, and he, he was teasing me because he said, I saw one of those things that you talk about, because, you know, he's a, he says, and, and he's asking me how I know to do certain things when I'm in the middle of a procedure, and I can't tell him how I know. He says, I just know. A sound, a smell, um, just something automatically takes me in that direction. How many of you have had that kind of a challenge when you've been teaching somebody something new young? Yeah, because we've developed these refined schema. Now, schema can change, so I'm going to give you an example of this. Now, I know some of you may have seen this, and if you have, please don't you know, shout it out. Let other people um, see the, the answer for themselves. If you've never seen this before, tell me if you can see anything identifiable in this picture, anything recognizable. Just raise your hand for somebody who hasn't seen it before. Yes, just shout it out over there. Yeah. It's so a face of a person. Face of a person. In the white. And in the white. Okay, good. Anybody else? Anybody see anything else? Yes. An animal? A cow. Okay, how many people see the cow? Okay, good. I'll make it easier for you. I'll superimpose the cow. Here we go. Okay. So, anybody who doesn't see the cow now? Okay. Now, I'll just point it out over here on this side. You see the two ears, the two eyes, a nose, and this is the forehead, okay? Over here, I'll do the same thing. Two ears, two eyes, a nose, and the forehead. If you still don't see it, we'll do a remedial session at lunchtime, okay? <laughs> now, I'm going to remove the cow and go back to the original picture for a moment and tell me now whether you can avoid seeing the cow in the original, in the original picture. <laughs> Something that was invisible to you just a moment ago is now impenetrably in your line of vision. If I show it to you an hour, a day, a week, or a month from now, you'll see cow just like that. This is the way the mind works. A schema can be flipped just that quickly. Now, let me ask you something. If you were to imagine having two groups of people, some we might call in the dominant group, and I mean by that the predominant cultural group, which in American society generally means white, male, Christian, heterosexual, for example, or in the non-dominant group, which group do you think is more likely to have a schema that's sensitized to see issues around their identity? The non-dominant group, of course. Because if you're in a dominant group, the culture is your culture. You know, you can pretty much function in that culture most of the time without paying a lot of attention to it. If you're in a non-dominant group, you better read those rules. You better watch out for those traps and landmines. This is why women will tend to see gender dynamics more clearly than men. Remember, I said tend to, not always, of course, because I'm talking archetypically, not stereotypically here. But tend to, women will tend to spot gender dynamics more. People of color will tend to spot dynamics of race, and et cetera. We could go on through the whole list, but you get my point. And this is one of the challenges that comes up. Let's go back to our whodunit video. We leave that meeting, and somebody says to me, let's say a woman says to me, I think there's a gender dynamic. What are you talking about? Don't be so, so thin-skinned. Because my belief is, if I don't see it, it's not there. Now, this doesn't mean, by the way, that the other side of it isn't true, that somebody in a non-dominant group can't get so fixed in a position that they see those distinctions everywhere. Because that can happen too, and we've all seen that happen. You know, I remember when I was in the college, and mind you, this was 1968, 69, you know, and, and this was the time of Vietnam and all that stuff. And so I had a friend, and my friend had fallen in love with Leon Trotsky. That was his thing at the time. You know, there were people in that time who did that. And he just was fascinated with Leon Trotsky. And he could, we couldn't get him to stop talking about Leon Trotsky, because none of us were as, nearly as interested as Leon Trotsky as he was. But he would go on and on. And one night, we're all hanging around, and we're playing cards or something. And, and uh, somebody says, uh, do you have any ice? And uh, from this side of the room, we hear, you know, Leon Trotsky was killed with an ice pick. 
I mean, this is the way the mind can work. Everything associates like that, and you've all known people like that as well. So this is so schema gives us background. A background actually shapes, and I don't mean background like I grew up in DC in the 50s, although that's part of what shapes our background. I mean the ontological distinction of background, the philosophical distinction. That is the frame of reference which we use to see the world. And it becomes self-reinforcing. It's almost like a lens that we have, like a contact lens that somebody's put over our eyes that colors the world that we see without us even realizing that it's there. If you were to imagine a baby had a contact lens popped into their eyes and it was blue, the world would just occur as blue to the baby. And if you run into somebody who had a, a red one put into their eyes, we would argue about what color a piece of paper was, thinking that the other person was either crazy, stupid, or some variation on those, those themes. And this is the nature of the way we see the world quite differently. And background shows up in simple ways. So how many people here are roller coaster riders, for example? Yeah, who doesn't do roller coasters? Yeah. Then there's the third category, those of us who used to do roller coasters but now don't. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so for those of us who like roller coasters, we see a roller coaster and we say, you know, roller coasters are fun. Why? Because we have a background of excitement about them. When we see them, we go back to our, our storage capacity in the mind and we say, oh, that's like such and such. And so we project fun. We expect fun. If, of course, the other side, we go back to our background of fear or nausea, depending upon which it is for you, and then we project that. But the point is, we think we see the roller coaster as it is, but we actually see the roller coaster as we are. And how many of you have had somebody try to talk you out of being afraid of something like a roller coaster? Like, roller coasters really aren't scary, like, right? Which speaks exactly to the heart of what I'm talking about. Think about how insane that is. It's almost as if scary lives in the roller coaster. Really, think about that. How else could I be talking you out? Roller coasters aren't scary. Well, how would you know? Because scary only lives in me. And this is one of the challenges that we have when we're dealing with these issues. Now, of course, the same thing happens when we see a person. You, know, you see somebody who's a particular appearance, and you immediately go back to your database. This is what stereotypes are all about. And you make up stuff about that person. So put ourselves in the streets of Ferguson, Missouri. You know, two people come together. Darren Wilson, the police officer, drives into that community. That community has a history. And he says, in the interviews after the fact, he says, I drove in, I knew I was going into hostile territory. I knew they didn't like us there. The they, of course, was the people in the African-American community. The us were the police. Michael Brown walks down the street. He also has a background history. A history which we later found out about because of the Justice Department studies of Ferguson that there were numerous incidents, at least a half dozen just in a couple of years previous to that, where young African American men in particular were hassled by white police officers largely for doing nothing. And so he sees a white police officer and he's now on alert. And those two come together and it's like a match hitting gasoline. Now, we'll never know what actually happened there completely because one of the people who was there died. But the point is, so I'm not going to get into the whodunit side of it. That's not the point. You all have the same thing, of course, happen every day. You come into meetings with people. You deal with sometimes with patients. You deal with students. You deal with all of that. We'll be talking about all these different relationships this afternoon. And any number of things can trigger those kinds of responses based on our experience. So as, as Goethe said, we see what we look for, and we look for what we know. And my guess is that everybody here knows that you have certain hot spots about certain things. Just, just actually, I'm going to do a couple of these. So I want to have an agreement with you. And that is when I put you into quick sharing, and I'm talking about sometimes one or two minutes. Um, and when it's time to call you back, rather than try to shout over you, I'll just raise my hand. And if you could raise your hand and stop talking. Um, and then when other people see you, they'll do the same. Now, one caveat is it doesn't work if you raise your hand and keep talking. OK? OK. So just turn to, just do this one-on-one -on -one sharing for, the, for brevity. Turn to a person next to you and see if you can think of a time when you were with some person's circumstance in, a, in, the in the work environment, preferably. If not, use something else, where you saw something, made an assumption about something that was either completely different from somebody else's or that you later found out was completely different than the reality of the circumstance. You know, you made a quick judgment about a patient in a clinical setting or you made a quick judgment about a student when they walked into your classroom for the first time or something like that, okay? Just very quickly, 45 seconds each, go. Okay. 
Wow, it works as well as it does with my grandchild's classroom. Okay, great. Not hard to find something, is it? You know, it's not hard to think of some time that we've done something like this because it happens all the time. We even tell jokes about it. You know, like the joke about the two people who are in a car accident and the father and son are in a car accident and the father dies and the son gets rushed to the hospital and, you know, they take him in and the surgeon comes into the room and the surgeon says, you know, I can't, I can't operate on this child. It's my son. Who's the surgeon? No, it's the gay father, the other gay father. You know, so, yeah. Yeah. Okay, so... Again, 1,500 studies. I'm just going to very quickly, don't try to remember any of this stuff, because, but I just want to very quickly give you a sense of some of the other studies, because they cover not just some of the typical things we think, but almost any nature of human identity. Uh, height is one. Uh, in Sweden, they found that uh, when they studied over a million guys, they found that taller men were more likely to become CEOs and get paid more as CEOs. In the US, actually, only 14% of men are over six foot tall, but 60% of corporate CEOs are, are six foot tall. In fact, an inch of height is worth almost $800 per year. <laughs> now, personally, I don't think there's anything wrong with this one. Yeah. Um, <laughs> another one, accents. Researchers at the University of Chicago and University of Tel Aviv found that we believe people more when they have an accent similar to ours and less when they have an accent different from ours, with one exception. Anybody? British, that's right. We not only think that Brits make better movie villains, but they also are smarter, right? I have a client in New York, and, and one of the people who works there came from Liverpool, which most of us know from the Beatles, but it's a blue-collar town, and they speak a form of, of Cockney there, which I think it's called Scosche, or Scouse. Scouse? Is that right? Scouse, thank you, thank you, I appreciate it. And, uh, and he says whenever he flies back to visit his family in Liverpool and then comes back to the U.S., he says, I feel myself getting smarter every mile I fly. <laughs> Um, uh, weight is another one. Doctors, that, I mean, researchers at at least four major universities have found that doctors discriminate against patients who are overweight. They spend less time with them, follow up less on protocols, tend to be more dismissive of patients' concerns and complaints. But at the Hop in Hopkins, at the Bloomberg School, some researchers who I know there found that patients do the same thing to doctors, that they listen to what doctors say less and evaluate their patient service at a very different level than they do people who are seen as physically fit. Um, and then there's this one, which is particularly important, I think, here. And this, this is actually the academic name of the study. You can look it up. It was done at the Veterans Administration Hospital. What they did was they tracked physicians who went into coding situations. So, you know, the emergency room situation when the doctor takes over and, you know, tells people what to do very quickly. It's like a sailboat in the storm. It's not the time for the captain to do consensus leadership. You know, the, the, the doctor takes over. Male doctors leave that circumstance feeling very good about themselves, get a lot of pats on the back. Female doctors not only have this B word associated with their behavior when they, because they're seen as, as so, you know, bossing people around, therefore this B word, but here's the thing that's fascinating, that the female physicians were found to often go around and apologize for the way they acted in the room. That it was so internalized, that expectation that people would be judging you that way was so internalized that people automatically were judging themselves and then compensating for it. And then this is my new favorite one. This came from the National Academy of Sciences just uh, about a year and a half ago. They studied, they studied the, the, the most um, fatal hurricanes in the last 60 years, removing Hurricane Katrina and Audrey, which killed so many more than any others that it would have skewed the data. Um, and then they tracked them by gender name of hurricane to see if there was any relationship between the gender name and the fatalities related to the hurricane. And it turned out that there was, in fact, that hurricanes na named after women kill roughly twice as many people as hurricanes named after men. Now, this has no relationship to that old saying, hell hath no fury like a woman scorned. It's nothing to do with that. Believe it or not, the researchers at the National Academy of Sciences, now mind you, this is not some hippie think tank up in the mountains in the West or something. This is the National Academy of Sciences, after studying this, determined that the reason is, believe it or not, that we take hurricanes named after men more seriously and prepare more. How insane is that? Think about the conversation. David comes up to me and he says, Howard, there's a hurricane saying. I say, really, coming? Really, what's its name? He says, Hurricane Mary. I say, don't worry, it's a girl. <laughs> this is how... This is how our minds work around this stuff. Not just them, folks, us. And I could go on if we had more time you know, to give you all kinds of examples. I want you to be thinking about how this shows up for you. And one of the things I'm gonna, I'm gonna ask you to do at lunchtime is to actually engage in this question you know, during your, while you're talking breaks and stuff. I know you're gonna have a speaker, but I mean, just casual conversation. What are some of the areas? Don't get into pointing people out. That's not the point here. 
Now, I'm not saying this person who I work with or this professor or this doctor, that's not my point. My point is, where are some of the places this might show up? Because it's critical for us to recognize the breadth and depth of it. You see, I could give you a study about every dimension of human identity that you know exists, virtually. I mean, I could probably find it. Like I said, over 1,500. When I was doing my first book, my wife walked into the room that I was writing in, and I was just sitting back at the desk looking like this at one point. She says, what's wrong? I said, I've just read my, about my 150th study, and I'm now completely convinced I have no idea whether what I'm thinking is accurate anymore. Because what the data leads us to is the question is not do we have bias, the question is which are ours. We all have them. And you all know what I'm talking about. I grew up in a family that comes from you know, Eastern Europe, we're Jewish, and I know folks who are Jewish who will rail against anti-Semitism and then make a questionable racial comment. I know people of color who will rail against racism and then make a homophobic or a heterosexist comment. I know LGBTQ people who will rail against that and then make some questionable comment about immigrants. You know anybody who doesn't got something going on with somebody? And this is the nature of how we see the world. We're constantly judging and evaluating people. And the challenge is, of course, as I said before, when we start to see ourselves as somebody who's above that, we become particularly susceptible to our own blind spots. And by the way, what do you call biases when you all agree to them and even write them down? That's all qualifications are. Now, I'm not saying qualifications are a bad thing. Qualifications can be very helpful. You know, when we got, we put out a posting recently for a job and we got over 200 resumes, we were not gonna interview 200 people. So we had certain qualifications. So one of them was college degree for this particular position. So as we're sorting through the resumes, goodbye Steve Jobs, goodbye Bill Gates, goodbye Mark Zuckerberg. And, and this is the challenge, is that we set these standards, but the standards may not reflect what's actually going on, and they can become calcified. A friend of mine calls it, um, never mind, I forgot. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, attitudinal sclerosis, that's what he calls it. He says hardening of the attitudes, right? Um, so, uh, so anyway, so I'll give you an example of what I'm talking about. How many people here know who Mike Singletary is? Raise your hand. Yeah, so Mike is, um, was a middle linebacker for the uh, Chicago Bears back in the, from about the late 70s to the early 90s. A lot of people consider him to be one of the best at his position to ever play in the National Football League. He, uh, Mike and I met when he left football and he was doing a lot of leadership training and we worked together for a while, became friends. And he used to tell this story, it was a perfect example of the challenge with calcified qualifications. Um, he went at Baylor, All-American, all always wanted to play for the Dallas Cowboys. They were his local team. So at the end of every year, um, football fans know that the National Football League brings all the best college students together, players together, and runs them through something called a combine. They do it in Indianapolis. It's about a five-day camp. And they run them through like 100 different tests, measure everything, physical ability, um, emotional stability, leadership, intelligence, all of this stuff. And at the end of it, Tech Schramm, at the time the president of the Cowboys, comes up to Mike and says, Mike, you broke the bank. You were the best person here. I wish we could draft you. Mike says, what do you mean you wished you could draft me? Tech says, you know, Mike, we don't draft linebackers shorter than 6'2", and you're 5'11". It's a true story. They didn't draft him. He says, every time he played the Cowboys, he especially kicked their butt, and then he found Tech Schramm on the other side of the field. <laughs> now, how many times have we seen that person who's the iconoclast, the slightly different approach? Let's put it in terms that are more real for us. You've got two people applying to college. Over here, you have a person. I'm going to use, I live in a D.C. area, so I'm going to use D.C. regional, you know, uh, locations. In the Potomac Chevy Chase area, which is most of you have probably heard about, it's the high end area. Young man grew up in that, in that environment. Mom and dad were both professionals, so he had built in tutors, of course. Had a lot of money, so he didn't have to worry about working after school. His parents just wanted him to participate in as many extracurriculars as possible, so he was on the debate team and the soccer team and student government and all those kinds of things. When SAT time came around, he took two SAT prep courses and had a private tutor to work with him to make sure he did well. And then, of course, also did the test a couple of times to get the highest score. And he had a 4-0. Over here, you have person number two. This young man grew up in Anacostia, which is a, a low-income African-American part of, of DC. He grew up, let's say, in a single-parent home 
with um, a mom or dad who worked 12, 13 hours a day to support he and his two siblings. Uh, in the morning, in order to help out, he would wake up, get his sibs ready for school, feed them breakfast, walk them to school, go to school himself, pick them up after school, take them to their aftercare program, and then go do his part-time job, which he did to help support the family. He then picked the kids up, take them home, feed them dinner, until mom or dad came home at about 8 o'clock or 8.30, at which point he could finally do his homework, go to sleep, and go to, and uh, wake up the next day. Of course, on the weekends, he also worked to help support the family. Had no opportunity to do extracurriculars, because his extracurriculars were family responsibilities. And uh, of course, none of those other assists as well. He ended up with a 3.6 and lower, lower SAT scores. Now, I'm not saying that makes him better, but one could see, one could easily make the case that somebody who managed all of that responsibility at that young an age and produced at that level is a pretty compelling character. And if all we measure is what we think are apples to apples, then we're missing the point. And this is the challenge that we have as we do, as we do this work. So. So let's, I promised you we'd talk a little bit about the neurobiology of this, um, because as it says up here, we don't think the way we think we think. Now, my, my English professor would have hated that sentence, I know. Um, nonetheless, it's, it's in fact true. Uh, for 2,500 years, we've worshipped at the altar of the rational in our culture. It goes all the way back to Plato. Some of you remember you know, Philosophy 101, Phaedrus dialogues, when Plato, Plato talked about how the rational mind was like the charioteer who held the raging emotions in place. And the philosopher kings came from the rational mind. And for 2,500 years, we've worshipped at the altar of the rational. It's built into our language in, in this culture. You sure you're being rational about that? You sure you're not being emotional about that? As if being emotional means worthless or less valued than rational. But the problem is that the research, what the research is now showing, and, and people like Daniel Goleman, who's doing, doing work in emotional intelligence, have shown this now for years, over almost 30 years, that virtually every decision we make stems from our emotional reaction. And so here we are looking here where the real issue is here. It's sort of like the story that some of you probably have heard from the Sufi tradition. You know, the Sufis were the mystical tradition of Islam, and they, a lot of stories in the Sufi tradition, like Aesop's fables, one of them is that a um, guy comes up to a person who's on their hands and knees under a street lamp looking for something and says, what are you looking for? He says, I lost my keys. So he gets down to try to help him, and they're looking for a while. And he says, well, where'd you last see him? And he says, I dropped him in the alley down the street. He says, why are you looking here? He says, the light's better here. <laughs> That's kind of how we are. We're looking in the wrong places for the answers. So we know at a very fundamental how level, you know, how the brain processes this. And like I said, this is, this is very simplistic, I realize, for those of you who really know this stuff. <laughs> so we see some catalyzing person or circumstance out there, and we immediately have a reaction. It gets filtered through the background of our experience. We actually see it through that background. So I'll use LaRonda as an example up here, and she's wearing this burgundy outfit. And I see LaRonda, and, uh, and you know, I had this immediate reaction, like, something about her I don't feel comfortable with. We've all had either a positive or a negative reaction like that. How many of you have seen somebody within five seconds, you said, something about this person I like? And how many of you had the reverse reaction? Right. So we know this is what we do. Now, even that, by the way, is kind of silly, because in five seconds, you don't even know the person. So obviously, there's projection here. But what I'm not even aware of is that my mind has gone back to a time when I was in eighth grade. And when I was in eighth grade, we used to have these things called sock hops. Some of you have heard of those probably. A few of you remember them. We used to dance on the gym floor in our socks after the games, right? And in those days, of course, since, since anything but heterosexuality didn't exist in anybody's consciousness, in most people's consciousness, I mean, it was like never talked about. I'm talking now about 50 years ago. Um, nonetheless, by the way, this isn't a real story. I'm just making it up. The boys lined up on one side of the room. The girls lined up on the other side of the room. And it was the boys' job to walk across the room and ask the girls to dance. Y'all remember, some of you remember this, right? So I walk all the way across to this girl named Sally, who was my first crush. And I get to her and ask her to dance. And she not only says no, but she laughs at me in front of my friends. And in front of all of the people I'm in the place, I have to walk African all the way back. Physician. And the whole time I'm saying, never I ain't possible. never doing that I shit use evidence-based right. medicine and the standard of care. Sally, I don't remember this in my conscious mind, but my unconscious mind remembers it, was wearing burgundy. In my mind, burgundy and rejection get linked. And all of a sudden, I meet LaRonda 40 years later, or however many years later. In Chinese culture, and something about a her new makes mom me feel who just delivered this a baby the will not works. actively We know what happens. We first go to newborn. what Daniel um, Kahneman called fast brain um, in the limbic system. The just to borrow something from, um, 
uh, Brian Siegel, who's at uh, um, uh, UCLA, I'll use my hand this way. If you imagine your hand being a brain like that, then the limbic system is, is in here. It'd be better if I had two thumbs, but it's deep inside the brain. And this includes several different organs. The amygdala, most of us have heard a lot about. The amygdala's had a big decade. Scans to find out what's wrong or what's safe. Um, if you were to design a brain and evolve it over thousands of years, would you have it be designed to be more sensitive to things that are rewarding coming your way or dangerous? Dangerous, of course, because you miss reward, nice surprise, you miss danger, dead. So we're scanning to be sure everything's safe. We see something, oh, burgundy thing, burgundy uh, color. I go back to, um, to the hippocampus, my memory center, kind of look through the file cabinet, ah, oh, Sally in eighth grade, and then to the hypothalamus, the air traffic controller of the brain, which says, watch out puts me into a defensive mode. And that's very, very rudimentary way the fast brain works. Brilliantly um, valuable and important to us. When you're driving here this morning, somebody stops short in front of you in the car, the tail lights go on, you do not want to go to your slow brain and say, what's the best way to handle this circumstance? Or you're in their back seat. You know, quick response saves your life in that particular case. Your foot hits the pedal before you even notice it. It's there. And some of, some of you have had the feel, you could feel the chemical release in your body, right? That, that release of, uh, we'll talk more about that in a couple minutes. So let's give an example. Take a look at this. Or just raise your hand if you can find the mistake in this picture. And again, if you've seen this before, don't do it. But otherwise, let's see. Somebody way in the back. Can you shout it out for us? Yeah, very good. Two does. This was not hard to see. It didn't take time, did it? Once again, the light's better here. I, mean, I said, you know, the mistake on this page. I didn't say the mistake in these numbers. But that's where we naturally look. So, you know, our fast brain leads us to make questionable decisions. And a lot of you know that there's some brilliant work being done now in behavioral economics around this. For example, and this is an actual subscription page. I apologize for it being a little blurry, but I, it, you know, got blurred in sizing it. Um, for The Economist magazine, three different kinds of subscriptions. $59 for an online subscription. That's the top one. The middle one says $125 for a paper subscription. The third one says, what a bargain, $125 for both. <laughs> Who could resist, right? Americans love a bargain. So, of course, this is what the numbers look like. 84% choose that last option. Hey, I got something for free. Right? So Dan Ariely at Duke University, a brilliant behavioral economist, says, uh, what happens if we take out the middle option? doesn't really fundamentally change the choice, but it fundamentally changes people's reactions. Because now you have a choice between online or paper, in essence. Do you really need paper? Well, 2 thirds of the people say no. And here's a similar one, because this happens, in, as, as Scott said earlier, this is impo particularly important in complex decision making. So um, some researchers at the University of Toronto said they were looking at how do you do hip replacement they say, or, or hip pain. So somebody's got hip pain, and you go to that person and you say, do you want to get hip replacement surgery, or we can put you on ibuprofen, or we can put you on a paroxicam. And what happens is most people go to surgery. Most people say, let's do surgery. But when you eliminate one of the other two choices, almost everybody goes to the drug. As soon as we have complex choices, we go to what occurs as simpler to us, even if it makes no sense. This is the way the fast brain works. It confuses our decision making. Then, of course, we have a slow brain. Now, going back to the model, to, to, to Siegel's model, you know, the prefrontal neocortex, most amazing part of the human brain, uh, three to four times larger than any other animal, two to three times more powerful, gives us the capacity for metacognition, the ability to say, hmm, what made me think about that, to observe our thoughts. Unremarkable for human beings, extraordinary in the animal world. How many of you have had dogs? Anybody here had dogs? Yeah, how many of you, when you put your dog out in the backyard and it sees a squirrel, have any sense that it says, should I chase that squirrel? <laughs> squirrel. We have the capacity as human beings to be more thoughtful about that. So the slow brain gives us that capacity. And this is where, of course, our mindfulness, our thoughtfulness comes from, when we can slow ourselves down and observe. What makes me want to hire that person? What makes me want to give that student that grade? What makes me want to react this way to my patient? When we begin to look at the lens that we're looking through, rather than just what's seen through the lens. And the challenge is, because of the nature of the way we've done diversity and inclusion work, and this is why I titled my first book, Reinventing Diversity, in our effort to stop the bleeding, which had to happen and still has to happen, we've actually created 
as I said before, more contraction and fear around the subject rather than more invitation to inquire into the subject. So rather than being able to say to myself, well, I might have a bias here I better be careful about, oh my God, I'm, not good. I, I'm a good person. How can I have bias? And it actually gets in the way of our being able to deal with these issues. By the way, if you've been sufficiently impressed, I'm going to take my jacket off, okay? <laughs> um, so let me show you how the, the fast brain and the slow brain work together. I'm going to show you a series. Some of you I know are probably familiar with Stroop testing, but it really doesn't matter. You can do it anyway. Um, no, I mean, it's not going to affect the, your experience here. Um, I'm going to show you a series of letter combinations. Um, some of them will be words. Some of them will just be mixed up letters. It doesn't matter. All I want you to do is speak out loud the color of the font that you see. OK? So let's try. OK, good. I'm going to go fast, so see if you can keep up. It's true. People in Michigan do know their colors really well. OK. <laughs> Let's do it again. You did a great job. Let's do it one more time. <laughs> yeah, what happened? Did you feel the tug of war in your brain? That's a tug of war between your fast and slow brain. You had a very clear slow brain instruction that I gave you, and you had no problem with the first time. The second time, you also got a fast brain instruction. It didn't come from me. It came from your innate experience. It was an unconscious fast brain um, instruction. And that was that letter combinations mean words. And how many of you noticed that the R for red came before the G of green in the first one? Yeah, Because we might say that the fast brain is like the older sibling to the slow brain. It gender tended, because, because it's survival oriented, it will tend to motivate us in that way. So. Um, just to give you a sense of comparison, if we think of the slow brain's capacity as, as something like a, um, a gallon milk jug, the fast brain is like the Milky Way. Literally hundreds of thousands of times more fast brain activity than the slow brain activity. And the same thing we just saw with those words shows up when we interact with people. So I have somebody who comes in to interview with me, and I am committed. My slow brain message is treat everybody equitably, give everybody a fair shot, and all the time my fast brain has got its stereotypes pumping. And so I take the same behavior and I deal with it differently. John gets a better rating than Jennifer. And it's not because I consciously like men more than women. It's unlikely that the female faculty, for example, felt that way. It's just that it shapes the way I see things in subtle ways. Now, in a way, it's a lot easier to deal with egregious examples because they're right in front of us. So there are a number of different patterns in the mind that I want to talk about very quickly um, to set up our conversation later. The first is selective attention, inattentional blindness. We saw an example of this with the whodunit video. Um, uh, researcher at Harvard Medical School, Trafton Drew, um, did this exercise. If you notice in the upper right lobe of this lung scan, there's something unusual. It's a little uh, gorilla that's been superimposed in there. You can see it a little bit more clearly than the original because we put white border around it to make it a little bit visible. He gave it to a group of uh, radiologists and asked them to look for uh, uh, cancer nodes, which are, of course, very tiny, about 1 50th the size of the gorilla. They were looking so closely for this that 83% didn't see the gorilla. That's a little frightening, isn't it? But you could also imagine the conversation with the patient. I think we know your problem. You have a gorilla in your lung. You know? Now, this happens not just because, um, well, actually, well, actually, let me set that up. This happens not just because of what we see, but also what we're told. So watch this. Meantime, two teenagers are wounded on the city's south side. It happened at East 74th as an 18-year-old man and 16-year-old girl were hit while standing on the sidewalk. The male's in good condition while the girl's expected to recover. And kids on the street, as young as four, were there to see it all unfold and had a disturbing reaction. No, I'm not scared of nothing. When you get older, you gonna stay away from all these guns? No. No? No. What do you want to do when you get older? I'm gonna have me a gun. You're because I live right here, and I don't want none of my family members to get shot. That is very scary indeed. So far, no suspects are in custody. Yeah, it is very scary, isn't it? And especially that little boy. It's chilling to watch that, isn't it? Yeah, only one problem. I'm going to show you something that's even more chilling. And this is another version of the video of the little boy that was taken by a bystander with their cell phone. This is the same interview unedited by the newscast. That's what I like to hear. You ain't scared of nothing. Damn. When you get older, you going to stay away from all these guns? No. No? No. What do you want to do when you get older? I'm going to have me a gun. You are? 
Why are you going through that? You know what happens? I'm going to be the police. Okay, well then, then you can have. A little different context it creates, isn't it? Now, I, we, I have no idea, and I'm not, you know, I'm not going to make, you know, any assumptions because I, you know, whether they did that on purpose or whether they did it because they were on a deadline, and, you know, because I've seen that happen where, where I've worked with media a lot, where they'll like, all right, that's enough, cut it out, they don't even see the end, but one suspects it fit the narrative that they were trying to create. And I've certainly seen that happen as well. Even with people who were interviewed right next to me, the things were taken, cherry-picked out of those interviews to, to prove a point. But the more important point is how much of this are we bathed in every day? Depending upon which news source we watch, or which blogs we read, or which Facebook posts we see, or, or anything else, all around us. So all of this is happening all of the time. Now, one of the things that could happen, and I talked about Ferguson as a good example of this, is when we are in a situation which is sort of high internal drama, it brings up a tremendous reaction on our part. What happens is what um, Goldman calls um, an amygdala hijacking. Now what happens when our amygdala hijacking occurs, when something is, is, is a dramatic sh shock to us, and, and all of you have had this happen, something surprises you, is that the system goes on high alert. What actually happens is the system is bathed in adrenaline, epinephrine, and cortisol, and we're like this now. Is everybody, raise your hand if you know the feeling I'm talking about. Right, yeah. At that moment, a number of things happens in our brain. One is that we move towards reactive responses, so fight, flight, or freeze. We're much more sensitive. It's almost like our system becomes like, like sunburned skin. You know, we're, we tend to be more reactive, bouncing off of things rather than thinking about them. The second is, and this is particularly important when we understand what's going on in our society today, is that we tend to move towards a desire, a desire for control and authoritarianism. This is a lot of what's going on underneath the Trump phenomenon. And I don't mean to get political about this because that's not the point. I'm talking about just analyzing the dynamic. Things aren't right, and here's somebody who's really strong and really authoritative who's going to make it better. And I'm not even responding to what he's saying. This is what the pundits aren't, aren't understanding. It's not about what he's saying. It's about who he's being. And, you know, there may be some people here who are fans or not. That's not the point. It's that kind of energy. And, and this showed up at other times, too. If you remember after 9-11, in the weeks following 9-11, George Bush's, uh, President Bush's um, uh, approval rating went up to 93%. Just a few months after half the country thought he was an illegitimate president, that he hadn't gotten the, the right number of votes, everybody's like, strong voice will save us. And this is what happens when we're in amygdala hijacking. And then the third is that we begin to perceive things as being permanent, pervasive, and personal. Again, an explanation why more than 60% of people in the United States today who live in rural environments in the United States believe that they are personally vulnerable to terrorist attack. Even though you know, nothing rational would suggest that that would be a place where terrorists would strike. I'm not saying it's impossible, but it's not consistent with any data involved. And so, so this happens. Now, what do we do in cases like this? And this is imp particularly important relative to the president's comments about Islamophobia. We take a small example of a real threat from a group, and when the amygdala gets hijacked, we turn that into a pervasive perceived threat among the whole group. It's safer to be afraid of all of them. This is what the brain's saying. I'm not saying this is true, but this is what the brain's saying. Safer to be afraid of all of them than to try to have to figure out which of them to be afraid of. And this is where the isms come from. And then, of course, followed by, and this is why we're going to be talking this afternoon about structures and systems, followed by structures and systems that are then put in place that reinforce that pervasive belief. So. Let's keep them out of the country. Let's go into their communities and get them registered. All of these things are structures and systems designed to protect us from this pervasive threat. And this can happen in schools around different others. It could be departments, people in that department. People who are those kind of scientists versus this kind of scientist. People who came from that background of schooling versus this kind of background. You, you fill in the differences. The us versus thems are all over the place. Right? So fear becomes generative. So we have fear, and that leads to behavior. So let's put this in the context of Islamophobia right now, because it is a pervasive fear in our culture. So I have fear about Muslims, and so when I see people who are Muslim, let's say, I start to feel a little nervous and act a little weird. I see somebody in a hijab, or somebody who's wearing a skull cap and a, and a beard and, a, and an outfit that looks to me to be um, Muslim, and I act a little standoffish, or even protective, or even aggressive in some cases, as we're seeing happening more and more. That causes an impact on the person. 
The reaction of that person emotionally is likely hurt or anger. Hurt or anger leads sometimes to counter-reaction. Well, if you're gonna treat me that way anyway, then I'll do this, which then feeds the beast. And this accelerating cycle continues on and on and on. The question becomes, of course, how do we break that cycle? Now, a second dynamic of this is projection. I already talked about this, so I'm gonna go through. This is what I was talking about with LaRonda. We know that we project into people all the time. We project into things. How do we know this is a chair? Because we've seen lots of things like this called chair. If you put one of these things on its side and show it to a Kalahari Bush person, they might think it's a shield, they might think it's a weapon, they might think it's a weird kind of hat. They don't have the context necessarily, chair. For us, it's obviously a chair. And so we know that projection happens in that way. So let me give you a couple of examples. And by the way, Amy Cuddy's done, and Susan Fisk and Peter Glick have done some really great work about looking at this, both in terms of how warmly we feel towards people and also how competently, because they're different. So for example, we think about the biases that people have about people with disabilities. It's not about warmth. You could be really loving towards somebody with a disability, but you might negatively assume low competence on their part. And, and in reverse, you may not have any competent issues with people, but they just make you feel uncomfortable. So this is where a lot of LGBT bias comes from, or um, anti-Semitism, or anti-Asian bias, a lot are in that area. It's not about competence, it's about comfort. So, so I'm gonna show you a couple of pictures now. Imagine for a second that you're, uh, you've got a, a, son, um, a son or daughter who calls you, and they say, mom or dad, they're full grown. They say, mom or dad, I've met the one. This is the guy I'm gonna spend the rest of my life with and I'm so happy, I can't wait to bring him home in a month to meet you. And you're too anxious, so you go on the Facebook page. Who is this guy? <laughs> and you see them with two different men in two different pictures. This one or this one. Who are you hoping for? <laughs> right? Well, it turns out, it turns out that this is John Fetterman. He's the mayor of Braddock, Pennsylvania, went to Harvard, served in AmeriCorps. He did such an amazing job of transforming this old steel town into a vibrant community that he was reelected with over 75% of the vote and is now running for Senate in the state of Pennsylvania. This is Ted Bundy, the serial killer. <laughs> yeah. Or this picture. Just take a look at this picture and see what comes up until you see it in context. You know. Or this, anybody know who these folks are? That's right, five US astronauts. Or this one, is this a militia initiation? No, it's two men getting married the first day of marriage equality in the state of Washington. You see, this is what we do as human beings, we make stuff up. And it occurs, as I said, in the hippocampus. You know, I like to use the example of Leave it to Beaver because I grew up in the Leave it to Beaver generation. Um, so June Cleaver was the quintessential housewife, mother in those days, you know, and all, all those old shows were the same. Dad went off with either a briefcase or a lunchbox, depending upon the socioeconomics, you know, and mom stayed home, and in June's case, in her pearls and high heels, did all the housework, which I thought was bizarre even when I was a kid. And then, and then the kids did something mischievous, and dad came home and solved the family's problems. This was the MO of sitcoms back then, and also, showed up in a lot of our homes, you know. Um, if we grew up in that era, and not just that era, of course, we likely have an association in our mind between the role of women and the June Cleavers of the world. And then we flash forward 30, 40 years, and we're in a meeting, and in comes Dr. Joan Smith, and without even thinking about it, I turn to Dr. Smith and I say, hey, um, do you know if there's any coffee here? Because at that moment, Dr. Joan Smith becomes June Cleaver. And this is the way the mind puts things together. The third is social primacy. Now this one's important, especially for you, because you have the benefit of, as a group, working on these issues. And a recognition that it doesn't only happen individually. We're deeply affected by what's going on around us. Most people here are familiar with Maslow's hierarchy. Abraham Maslow in 1943 uh, created this extraordinary model which has been foundational in modern psychology. And he said that yet certain needs have to be met before others, starting with physiological needs and moving up the chain. Brilliant model, but it turns out that a lot of the current research in terms of watching the brain says that Maslow may have been wrong. That in fact, belongingness may be our key human need. And it makes sense if you think about it because what's the most vulnerable time of a human being's existence? Infancy, right? We can't survive as infants unless we belong to somebody. I mean, mom, dad, grandma, grandpa, whoever it is, somebody's gotta be there to provide our physiological needs. And for the, arguably the first two years of our lives, our main message is, I exist because you exist. 
which is why we know when we look at the brain that being excluded from a group triggers activity in the same regions of the brain, the cingulate gyrus, associated with physical pain. This is why almost every time one of these terrible things happens, like Sandy Hook or the like, what's the first word you hear to describe people? Loner, almost every time. Right? And it's also why four times as many gay teenagers, or contributes to the fact that four times as many gay teenagers commit suicide, because often isolated even within their own family. But it also can create behavior that's downright funny. The gentleman in the elevator now is a candid star. These folks who are entering, the man with the white shirt, the lady with the trench coat, and subsequently one other member of our staff, will face the rear. And you'll see how this man in the trench coat <laughs> tries to maintain his individuality, but little by little, He looks at his watch, but he's really making an excuse for turning just a little bit more <laughs> to the wall. Now we try it once again. Here's the candid subject. Here comes the candid camera staff, three of them at least. And uh, this man has apparently been in groups before. <laughs> Yeah, we laugh like we don't do the same thing, right? You know, how many of you have seen, some, you come into a calibration meeting about somebody and there's six of us around a table and you come in really high on the person and before you get to weigh in, the other five people trash them. And then they say, what do you think? And all of a sudden you're a little hesitant. Or you may even say to yourself, did I miss something? This is, this is the danger, this gets back to what was Scott, Scott was talking about, the danger of isolating the outlier and not having that different voice there. Because the fact that somebody's outvoted doesn't mean they're wrong, it may be that they're seeing something that we're not seeing. This is particularly true where identity is concerned because, for example, if one woman out of a team of five may notice something about that way the person is responding to her that no the other men of the team sees, may now notice a certain dismissiveness or that she asks a question and the person answers to the men, things like this, that, that how many women have seen things like that happen? Yes, not unusual, right, good. Okay, and the fourth one is, um, oh wait, we got social privacy. So the fourth one are subliminal influences. We're influenced subliminally all the time. So this was a study done at the University of Leicester in the UK. Um, this, this, these researchers, this woman, Melissa Basin, researcher, put a sheet of paper, eight and a half, eleven, 11, out of the printer, you know, nothing fancy, up on the wall. This is the honor system. You pay a certain amount for the cup of coffee, cup of tea you take in the break room. She sometimes they look like this, and sometimes like this. Piece of paper on the wall, what difference could it make, right? The black dots are the ones where the eyes were up, the white dots, in terms of how honest they were, the white dots where they, the flowers were up. A piece of paper on the wall affected us in that way. So now, how does that get real? At University of Toronto Medical School, they took medical school interview results, compared them against the weather reports over a six-year period of the interviews that were done on that day, and found that people interviewed on rainy days got interview scores that were roughly equivalent to if they'd gotten ding 10 points on their, on their MedCats. Happen to come in on a bad day like today? Tough. I'm in not as good of a mood, you don't get as good of an interview score. And yet, how many of us would even think to include the weather in our determination of how we're rating that person? And again, this is not them, folks. This is us who do these things. Now, I'm actually going to, I actually want to skip over this part and do it this afternoon, so, I, I'm, so close your eyes for a second. <laughs> I'm going to come back to this because I, want to, I don't want to feel rushed by it and, and end up with not enough time. Uh-oh, I was going too fast and I blipsed it there. Jimmy, can you uh, reset that for me, please? It's stuck. Then you meet my family in the meantime. Okay, whoops. Okay, while we're doing this, just take a minute, turn to the person next to you, and just, and just take a minute, probably, where are you seeing some of the dynamics I'm talking about show up? I apologize for the delay.
sorry. What's up? Um, go past that. Down. Down. Go to that one, the, the road there. That's great. Thanks. Good. Okay. All right, let me get you back. Here we go. See, this is another benefit of being tall. I can actually be here and you all can see me. Um, so the question is, and this is to set up, their, to set up our, um, our work this afternoon, how do we move forward if this is the case? Because basically what I'm telling you is that we're all robots bouncing around here thinking we're sentient human beings most of the time. Now, we occasionally pop our head out of the water and say, oh my god, this is you know, water we're in, kind of like there's a great, some of you who are fans of Gary Larson in The Far Side may have seen one of his great cartoons. It shows three cows in a field, and one of them's looking up with eyes this big and says, this is grass, we've been eating grass. You know, it's sort of that kind of feeling when you begin to see your own biases. You see, the road to unconscious bias is paved with good intentions. Good intentions are fine, doesn't bias a thing. So this is the misnomer we've had in dealing with public examples where people have been found saying something that's, that sounds biased or prejudiced is we assume intent. And then when they say, no, I didn't mean that, we say, well, you're just covering up. But the reality is most of the time, that's the case. They had no idea that they were doing what they're doing. So the good news is that we can change this dynamic. I'm gonna show you a really quick video clip here. Where I work, the welders are geniuses and they like to play jokes on the engineers. He had a challenge for me. He had built a special bicycle and he wanted me to try to ride it. He had only changed one thing. When you turn the handlebar to the left, the wheel goes to the right. When you turn it to the right, the wheel goes to the left. I thought this would be easy, so I hopped on the bike ready to demonstrate how quickly I could conquer this. And here he is, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Destin Sandlin. First attempt riding the bicycle. You can see that I'm laughing, but I'm actually really frustrated. In this moment, I had a really deep revelation. My thinking was in a rut. This bike revealed a very deep truth to me. I had the knowledge of how to operate the bike, but I did not have the understanding. Therefore, knowledge is not understanding. Look, I know what you're probably thinking. Destin's probably just an uncoordinated engineer and can't do it. But that's not the case at all. The algorithm that's associated with riding the bike in your brain is just that complicated. Think about it. Downwards force on the pedals, leaning your whole body, pulling and pushing the handlebars, gyroscopic precession in the wheels. Every single force is part of this algorithm. And if you change any one part, it affects the entire control system. I do not make definitive statements that often. But I'm telling you right now, you cannot ride this bicycle. You might think you can, but you can't. I know this because I'm often asked to speak at universities and conferences and I take the bike with me. It's always the same. People think they're gonna try some trick or they're just gonna power through it. It doesn't work. Your money cannot come with this. For instance, this guy. I offered him $200 just to ride this bike 10 feet across the stage. Everybody thought he could do it. No, 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 no. No, you didn't understand. You didn't understand. So, this way. <laughs> you have a rigid way of thinking in your head, sometimes you cannot change that, even if you want to. <laughs> so here's what I did. It was a personal challenge. I stayed out here in this driveway and I practiced about five minutes every day. My neighbors made fun of me. I had many wrecks, but after eight months, this happened. One day I couldn't ride the bike and the next day I could. It was like I could feel some kind of pathway in my brain that was now unlocked. 
It was really weird though. It's like there's this trail in my brain, but if I wasn't paying close enough attention to it, my brain would easily lose that neural path and jump back onto the old road it was more familiar with. Any small distractions at all, like a cell phone ringing in my pocket, would instantly throw my brain back to the old control algorithm and I would wreck, but at least I could ride it. Yeah, so it, so it is possible, and, and, and it's also possible to change systems. I mean, a lot of you know that back in 1970, only 5% of musicians in the major orchestras of the world were women. Even 10 years later, after 20 years of what we might call the modern women's movement, you know, it was still only 12%. It's now almost 40%. What happened? They put in a whole series of systems and structures that changed the way musicians were auditioned in major orchestras. The first is that rather than just by invitation, they started to advertise. So they put an ad in trade magazines. It used to be that the way it worked is the conductor would say, get me the second violin from Philadelphia to try out. Then the second thing they did is they started using panels. So rather than having just a conductor or sometimes the conductor and a producer hear the musician, they now had a team of panels as diverse as possible. But the third was the most important of all, and that is that they have musicians come in and audition now walking on rugs behind screens so that you not only can't see the musician, you can't hear their shoes too, which can be telltale in gender terms. And um, so now they're evaluating the music rather than the musician. This, by the way, for fans of The Voice is where The Voice came from, from this study. Yeah. This is the nature of change. It's, it's sustained over a period of time. We need to put systems and structures in to make it happen. So when we come back after lunch, well, you're going to be at a lunch talk, of course, but in the session we're doing after lunch, we're going to be looking at how do we, we'll, we'll tap on the power thing because that's critically important, uh, but we'll also tap on what are the things that we knew, need to do to create systemic change. Now, before you leave, there's an exercise of what you do. So if you could pass out the big decision folders, And this will only take you five or six minutes, and then you can go ahead and excuse yourself to get the meal. So what you, I'll give you a second for all the shuffling, okay? All of you at each table have the same candidate, but there are actually six candidates in the room, six different candidates and resumes. And, and they have you know, some similarities and some differences to the resumes. And, um, and your job is to read the resume and the narrative about the candidate. And just do this yourself for right now. Don't talk to your partner. When we come back, we'll process it together. Imagine that you're being asked to recommend whether or not to promote this candidate to be an information systems manager who'll be leading an internal customer service team. They'll be responsible for a staff of six to eight people serving the organization, and there won't be, there was, won't be a lot of direction for this position. So they have to be somebody who's pretty well self-managing. Read the resume and narrative in the booklet and rate the candidate from zero to 100% based on his or her suitability for the position. Then write down, uh, Ashley, what I want you to do, I know it says don't write on it, that's okay for this one, you can write on it. On the front page, right under the name that's in yellow of the candidate, in big enough letters so it's easy for us to see, just put that percentage. 100% is give them a name tag today, 0% is they don't even get taxi fare home. You know? So if you think that you would likely recommend this person based on what you're seeing, you give them a high number or a low number. Now I know usually hiring is binary, yes or no. In this case, I'm, I'm asking you to use a percentage. And then on a separate sheet, just for yourself, jot down a few of the adjectives that really strike you about this person. You know, so do you think that they're ambitious or do you think they're too held back? Uh, do you think that they're um, ethical or not ethical? Or, you know, things like this, whatever jumps you, so that you'll have those for discussion when we come back. Okay, and then um, write those down, put the number on the front, and then if you would just leave your folder right in the middle of the table, piled up with all the others so we can collect them quickly, because we're gonna have to crunch all this data while lunch is going on. So yeah, that would be really helpful if you could you know, put them in a common pile for us. Okay, great, thank you. And so moving to completion with that, and for those of you who feel like this is kind of bogus, you'd of, course not have, you'd of course have more time than this to make a hiring decision. That's of course true, but think about those times when you've had like, piles of resumes to look through and you make that first run through of those resumes. Do you really spend six or seven minutes on each of them? Or is it more like two or three to sort down to the 25 you're gonna look more carefully at? The, at you know? So it's not that far-fetched that we might eliminate people from these criteria. Okay, so, so move towards completion now, and if you could just write the number again, pile them in a central place in, your, in the pile, in the middle of the table so somebody can easily pick them up. And David, you gonna send people up there? Thanks. Thank you, <clears throat> thank you very much, Howard. That was great, <clears throat> and you'll get to hear more from Howard uh, after lunch with Maya Kabersi. 
In Chinese culture, a new mom who just delivered a baby will not actively participate in all the care to the newborn, excluding breastfeeding if they choose to. The family members, like the husband or the baby's grandparents, will do most of the care. The new mom is mainly to rest and stay in bed, especially during the first month after the delivery. We believe resting with good nutrition at this special time period will lead to excellent health in the long run. Not participating like this is very different from American moms and can be misinterpreted as a lack of interest. I wish the staff had asked questions or at least opened a dialogue with me and my family during my hospital stay. It would have been a better experience.